Herzlich willkommen im Kino des DFF. My name is Ellen Harrington. Ich bin die Direktorin hier. And I switched to English because I think you know tonight's talk is English. And we also have a guest coming to us all the way from Los Angeles. Um, and uh, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Rhea Combs. She um, has really moved heaven and earth to participate in this event. She's normally based in Washington, DC. She's actually on a business trip in Los Angeles, joining us from a hotel room. And I'm so grateful that she can do it. She is the Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. She has a illustrious curatorial and um, prof professorial background. She was one of the founding curators at the new um, Smithsonian African American History and Culture Museum, which is an institution that had to be created and a collection that had to be created. So it was really about, again, the concept in this conference is grappling with difficult histories. And she was part of a team with the director, Lonnie Bunch, that created an entire concept and a collection um, that didn't exist before to tackle this quite fraught history in the United States. Um, she's going to also talk with us a little bit about the new Academy Museum of Motion Pictures. Um, it's an institution in Los Angeles that just opened last month. Uh, that's where I used to work. I used to be the director of exhibitions and collections there. Um, and um, she is actually a curator on a very exciting project that will open in about a year called Regeneration. And it is actually one of the largest and probably the first in-depth scholarly examinations of African-American filmmaking history from the silent era up until the 1970s. So um, today, a lot of the talks, of course, were focused on some of the issues that are very prominent in um, Germany. And so it's going to be quite interesting to hear Rhea Combs' perspective on how she is addressing um, a lot of the things that are really bubbling to the surface and um, become quite a topic of public conversation in the United States at this time. So with that, I'm going to thank Rhea and ask her to uh, say hello, and she will give her presentation, and then she and I will have a short discussion, and then we will have microphones available for you all to ask questions. So again, welcome, and thank you so much, Rhea, and um, take it away. Let me start by thanking each and every one of you for coming this evening. I want to thank the organizers who made this program possible, a uh, special recognition to the director of the Deutsche Film Institute and Film Museum, Ellen Harrington. It's an honor to be a part of this national conference and critical conversation. I would also like to recognize my colleague, Doris Berger, Senior Director of Curatorial Affairs at the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles, who unfortunately is not able to join me, but who connected me with Ellen. Um, this year's theme, as Ellen has pointed out, difficult heritage is a timely and critical one made particularly poignant by activities of the recent past. Here, I'll show you a few images of some work I collected while at the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, because we were and remain very invested in making sure that the images and the stories that we tell of the, from the past have a relationship with the present. Um, let's see. So here I'm, I, I was able to acquire these images. This one is a photograph by a, a photographer named Zun Li. This is a photograph by a, a photographer named Derek Allen of the um, protests that took place in Baltimore against uh, the killing of Freddie Gray. And the preceding image was one that was taken again by Zun Lee in 2014 of, an, of the uh, 
murder of Mike Brown and the ensuing um, protests that took place. I share these images as a way to really sort of make connections with this conversation that we're having right now. Because in many instances, this conversation kind of was sparked by the poignant activities of the recent past, namely two summers ago, when people across the globe stormed the streets protesting racial injustice and asking many stakeholders um, across the, around the world to look at its sort of active participation in many of these histories um, that we now find as fraught. And, and difficult. So understanding that these conversations were happening in the United States two summers ago, 2014, uh, 2016, uh, and it, they are also happening internationally. And they're not um, only protesting on, in the streets, but as many of you all know, many museums are experiencing a reckoning of their own as staff are starting to openly challenge leadership and question provenance of many of the objects and artifacts filling the halls and special exhibitions of many of our national institutions. So I should say that I chose museum practice and have been working in this field for more than 20 years because I'm I was compelled to tell stories of people and experiences I knew were not being told in broad and diverse ways, but that I thought were critical to helping build a better society. So I place a high value on ideas, and it's important to me to be able to provide access and opportunity for broad intergenerational en engagement. History, biography, art, they can tell us so much about our past as well as our present and our potential, but it must be engaged in a way that complicates the narratives cultural heritage when studied carefully and uh, deliberately and with a deliberate consideration, it should not be an exercise in pure nostalgia, but instead it should challenge us to push past familiar and push past the familiar and comfortable. Uh, as the late British cultural theorist Stuart Hall wrote in 1996 uh, in his cultural essay, or in, in his essay, Cultural Identity and Diaspora, cultural identity is not only a matter of being, but of becoming, belonging as much to the future as it does to the past. So what Hall was arguing was that our identities, or in this instance, heritage, should uh, undergo should undergo constant transformation, uh, and, and a transformation that that transcends time and, and space. So, in other words, for me, when I'm thinking about these broader ideas of difficult histories of cultural heritage, of making sure that we connect the past and the present, I'm often asking myself, well, then why don't our didactic labels reflect that? Why do we have labels, um, you know, in museums that have been there for 10 and 15 years when we've learned so much, when our archival materials and, you know, research has uncovered so much? So I really do feel like there is a call to action, if you will, for us to really sort of engage these difficult histories in a much more deliberate deliberate and concerted way. Um, and it is that sort of engagement, this tension and this transcendence of time that I'm attracted to in my curatorial practice. As um, Ellen mentioned in, my, in the end, I've recently started as the director of curatorial affairs at the National Portrait Gallery. And prior to that, I was at the senior curator of film and photography at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African-American History and Culture. 
So one of my first charges in my current role is to examine and reconsider the museum's permanent collection. We have a gallery that encompasses three centuries from 1600s through 1900s um, that was initially called American Origins, uh, which is really kind of a fraught term because this was an area that covers an, an entire floor of the museum, the first floor, and room after room, there are about 11 or 12 consecutive galleries that you sort of march through that, um, you know, in this sort of historic building. Um, and this area, this room was covered with floors, with a floor that was filled with portraits primarily of men. And what I have called the hall of the dead, the, the dead male and stale. Uh, and so by unlocking the past and unpacking and discovering lesser told stories, my hope is a better understanding of the possibilities of the present and perhaps speculations about our future. This work is not always easy and shouldn't be filled with only feel good stories because what does that offer? If anything, too much gets lost when we don't push ourselves to explore more. One of the powers of visual storytelling and examining difficult histories is that it offers pathways to better understand people, movements, and moments that have been essential to the growth and development of a nation. As a result, the museum's curate. So in this instance, what I'm doing is I'm changing the way our exhibition in this permanent exhibition that looks from 1600 to 1900, changing the name, first of all, out, <laughs> no longer the master narrative. And we are working as a group, as teams of curators to re-examine the, the story, the sort of American story, if you will, the United States story. And the title of the, the show called Out of Many. And this is act sort of really at the heart of, again, my curatorial practice, but also what I think we're trying to get at when we're engaging difficult histories. Out of these histories have come from a range of experiences. And we start with, you know, an opening the portraits with Native Americans. We also incorporate more women. We um, you know, have an alcove that's entitled Encounter, Indigenous Americans and Europe Euro Europeans. From there, visitors could then move not only chronological exploration and early colonization, colonials no more, cultural, moral, and territorial identities are examining some of the complexities of what it means to build and form a nation. We look at very candidly sort of the dynamics of what took place pre-Civil War, during the Civil War, the Reconstruction period in America, and even sort of the Gilded Age. And initially the Gilded Age was this sort of broad stroked kind of exploration again with sort of dead male, pale, stale kind of, you know, sort of leaning. But now we're really talking about, we're bringing forward, you know, women, inventors, the role of religion and its relationship with politics and how those two things can be so intertwined. Um, and really also in this idea of working with some of these sensitive histories and cultures and cultures that may not be as familiar to all of us, we're, we're seeking the counsel of others. So for instance, in this image that I have here of Black Hawk, we are working with closely with our Native American um, museum, but we're also identifying and working with tribal leaders within various uh, Native American communities, making sure that the ways in which we 
understand the history, the way that history has been told and written is actually um, fairly is accurate, but also keeping in mind sort of, you know, sort of um, the other narratives and other stories and other perspectives from the Native American community. So that has been a real education for my curatorial team. You know, the way in which we might identify someone or the way in which we might understand their tribal affiliation or their role is not necessarily in alignment with us or historians. And we have found ourselves working very closely with communities that we wouldn't that historically museums would not have gone to museums would have identified themselves as the authority but we realize and recognize that there are many ways to tell a story and we want to make sure that we incorporate multiple voices so this is just one example um and again, by telling, by engaging, this does, this activity and approach does take in um, or has its challenges, I must say, because things take longer. Um, we have to plan for stories that we were invested in telling, not necessarily being the way in which we um, can always share or, or sort of in express within a label. And when you have a, only 150 words to tell a story, it makes it a bit more challenging. However, you know, we have remained committed to doing this work because, because it, I believe that as a person who grew up in the Midwest, where photographs and portraits were central to the way in which I understood the world, I know that portraiture, that photography, that museums sort of help chart a lineage and that the mantles of my family's homes and the halls of, you know, my relatives told a story that I did not often see in museums. But I feel that it is our sort of responsibility to make sure that we change that, that, you know, museums are, again, not to be this sort of master narrative, but we must be reminders that there are a variety, that history is told locally, regionally, and nationally, and that even the smallest, if you will, pebble can make a ripple. And I think that it is important as museum practitioners and as archivists and that we make sure that we resuscitate uh, these lesser known stories. Um, and so I'm often asked, how do we do this? How do we find these stories? And this was one of the arguments that was made when the National Museum of African American History and Culture was established. People would say to me and my colleagues, well, I mean, what stories can you tell? <laughs> what objects are there? I mean, and the reality is, Many of these things, as I've just said, you know, they're hiding in plain sight and that they and and they offer us. And when and when we look, when we take the time to recognize that the stories and the histories that we may be familiar with uh, are not the only ones, we then are allowing ourselves a deeper engagement and better understanding, not only of our, you know, the history and the world around us, but I think of society in generally, general. So digging through archives and seeing portraits and photographs from the 16th and 17th century or the 17th century, 18th century, excuse me, uh, to the present provides a you know, provides us evidence that representation matters. And it matters because it offers an important opportunity to make connections. While some of these images might uh, offer different narratives that can be perceived as difficult, they also serve as a form of resilience and resistance um, because these images of toil and activism and solitude 
family celebration, our declarations um, that despite horrors and terrors and ugliness, the human spirit has persisted and pers persevered and powered through. And in that sense, they become, these difficult histories become empowering. They offer up an everyday beauty, as I say. And what also, let's think about what would be the alternative, a saccharine history void of complexities and complications that offer a fantastical past and creates great, greater divisions. I don't think that's the way in which we want to function. So, you know, I think about this and I think about this image that I have here and, you know, the nearly eight and a half, over eight and a half years I worked as a senior curator um, at the African-American History and Culture Museum, which you can see here if, you, if some of you have never been there. This is located in the heart of downtown Washington, DC, across from the White House and um, next to the Washington Monument. And it truly, I think that intersection between next to the White House and the um, National Monument as an architectural ring. Um, and so, but while I was helping my, my team, my colleagues and I were helping to build this museum, we were reminded that, you know, what, what again, what will you say? What will you what will you be able to show? And I remember our founding director, Lonnie Bunch, he made a, a charge. He he charged us with not relying on loan items solely. You know, he went out and found objects um, in part because loan lending objects is for extended periods of time, it's very difficult, but also because he did not want it to seem as though there are not treasures buried, if you will, within our homes and in our basements and in within our archives. And so I was incredibly lucky to work with people and we found objects and artifacts owned by, for instance, Harriet Tubman. Uh, I mean, many, many that just pack the halls with just tremendous artifacts that were it held with local people, but that they tell a national story. There was this one example of this uh, photographer that I was able to identify by the name of Henry Clay Anderson. This is a photographer that's based in Mississippi. He took a lot of photographs of every house, uh, but then he had images like this one, which he took of this photograph of uh, Reverend George Lee, Lee's car after he was shot in Belzoni, Mississippi. Uh, and this work sh serves sort of, I think, as Roland Barthes would describe the power of photography. And, you know, it's showing the violence without us seeing the without exploiting the victim. In this image that in this instance, the damage to the car offers a striking solemnity toward the victim. Um, but one's imagination, I think, also should turn to who could do such a thing. And thanks to archival work and research, we're able to learn this car. And Reverend Lee was a Baptist minister. He was a member of the National the Negro, the, the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. He was a branch leader, in fact, and an advocate for voting rights for African Americans. He was a successful business leader. He owned a small business. Well, one night, the White Citizens Council. Um, which was a white supremacist in Mississippi, created shortly after uh, it was children separated um, in educational institutions. It was a, a verdict called the Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka ruling that said it was uh, 
not it was unconstitutional to have separate but uh they were more concerned the this white citizens council was more concerned with threat of their southern way of life disenfranchise voters through violence intimidation and threats things that we're still seeing to this day and so the white citizens council was developed spread throughout the state state this particular something that um you know was a long going sort of see of violence happening in Mississippi during the time. This is right around the time of a young man named Emmett Till who was um, murdered. This happened sort of three months before Emmett Till, the 14-year-old, was murdered for a parent for being accused of whistling at a white woman. But this, in this instance, George Lee and his friend were able to vote um, vote and they were stopped essentially um, by a sheriff who refused to accept their um, voter registration and they then were on their way home when they were followed by another car and then they were shot in the face at close range and they veered off and ran into the front porch porch of this um a, of a woman named Catherine Blair and the the George Lee the driver died on his way to the hospital but this was the photograph and so my point in showing this is that when we're thinking about difficult histories, when we're thinking about objects and the ways that we tell them, we're not only, you know, we have to think through all of the various dynamics and sometimes some of the most sort of, I don't know, innocuous vernacular photographs can really allow us to tell such rich dynamic histories. Um, and so I, this is what I find when I'm looking at this striking image that within just this one object or this one photograph, we're able to learn so much stories to be told. I think about this beautiful photograph by um, J.P. Ball. J.P. Ball was a... Uh, photographer from the 19th century who was born free uh, in 1825 in Frederick County, Virginia. He learned the art of the daguerreotype photograph by another free man of color named John Bailey. And by the age of 20, Ball had opened his first photography studio in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, which was a city that was heavily involved in anti-slavery activity. Unfortunately, Ball's business did not last long in Cincinnati, and he traveled throughout the United States um, sort of setting up these studios. Uh, and this one, he was one of the sort of most preeminent 19th century African Americans been since you know information to show that there were quite a few there was a large body of work of african-american photographers during the 19th century but jp ball is one of the finest and one of his prominent clients included frederick Douglass. And he eventually, after he sort of moved all around the states, he eventually moved west in Helena, Montana, around, and this photograph was taken around 1887. And the reason that these photographs, the one I just, this one um, and others like it are critical to collect when establishing a national collection and thinking about difficult histories is Again, they offer glimpses into a lesser known part of American history. The images offer, again, a, a, a glimpse of self-resilience, of self-determination, dignity, creativity during some of America's bleakest and brightest moments. They remind us that African-American history, again, is American history. And as 
curators, um, the archive becomes essential to our work because they offer a window into complicating these narratives. Um, and so it's really important when you think about this image shot in J.P. Monte in the late 1800s um, becomes striking not only because the woman is gorgeous, the, the clothes, this Victoria era balloon leaves, this, um, you know, the darting, the, the um, very, very, her stature is so regal. That is one sort of striking image you don't to see. It's interesting if anyone is familiar with sort of geography, the United States geography, Montana is one of the least populated um, states, at least when it comes to African-Americans. There's less than a half a percent of African-Americans residing in that state currently. So when when you look at this image, you think, oh my God, there was a, what other sort of rich historical, what other stories, what prompted this person this to, to be in, in Montana, in fact, because there was a thriving African-American community that had political clout in Montana at the time. Um, this image, once I sort of, I was unfortunately not to understand and learn more about Montana. It was African-Americans by a mere 2,000 votes that determined Helena as the capital, the state capital of um, Montana. The, you know, Black people held political offices during this time. There was a whole sort of range of property owners and businessmen. And J.P. Ball was active in that sort of community. Um, Ball was not uh, at a state civil rights co convention and ran for several offices on the Republican ticket. Um, his son encouraged Black migration west to establish homesteads. Um, and he wrote that it can, in, in the September 3rd, 1894 paper, the colored citizen that J.P. Ball's son, who also helped, who also owned this business, wrote in his first epoch, through force of circumstance, occupy a particular status in this country. We are not thoroughly known or better qualities are not presented fairly to the public. It's striking that that was in 1894 and that that sentence could still stand true in many respects about African-Americans in 2021. Um, the story about J. Paul is that unfortunately he was forced out of town for documenting and creating a multi-series photo um, named William Biggerstaff. Not much, not much is known about Mr. Biggerstaff, except that he was born enslaved in 1854 in Lexington, Kentucky. He was convicted of killing Dick Johnson, a prominent local prize fighter after an argument that occurred on June 9th in 1895. Biggerstaff, a temporary, he even was given a temporary stay of execution, um, but then eventually was hanged on April 6th of 1896. J.P. Ball created this sort of triptych of images that show Biggerstaff sitting for a photo in the Ball studio. Then he showed a picture of him hanging from a rope with two white men next to him. The Reverend Victor Day apparently is to his right and Sheriff Henry Jurgens is at his left. He then showed him lying dead in his coffin. 
coffin, all in the same suit. This three-piece suit he wore in the original studio portrait. But the lynching photograph and the coffin image show him wearing a wedding ring. This ring is a small image, but it immediately makes me wonder what else did he leave behind? Was the woman perhaps his wife? One never knows. My point is it's a, it's a tragic story that would serve again as this indelible impression that these images, the framing of these photographs um, have, that sc scholars have argued is, um, allows us to humanize bigger staff. We see him in a studio portrait, smartly dressed, but then we see him hanging, but some, in some ways on equal ground with the men who flank him. And then he's in his coffin in a funeral home, again, with this wedding ring. Having a Black person, J.P. Ball, document this dismantles some of the uh, misperceptions that all people, um, you know, th that it, it, one, it dismantles this misperception especially with respect to hangings, that all of these people that were documenting them were white. This lets us know that sort of blows that sort of preconceived notion out, out of the water. And um, some would argue that through Ball's um, sort of camera, we see bigger staff's citizenship in a greater way because most of the time we, in the United States would really fixate on that center image of him, of his hanging. We rarely sort of rely or, you know, sort of show people's hanging um, or, or excuse me, show them, you know, as a, when they were alive and then um, later as well, you just sort of focus in on the heinous crime. But it's also difficult to look at this work and not make a connection. Again, thinking about what I was saying in terms of my curatorial practice, making that connection with the past and the present. This to me is a really relevant or, you know, so you can draw conclusions with how cell phone culture has often recorded, um, you know, um, some of at least this country's most difficult histories, particularly around death and death of Black people. Um, and so Black authored works like this, be it photography or film, become particularly generative in terms of what they tell us about authorship, self-definitions, aesthetic value, and they help to retell stories that may have been overlooked. And to that point, um, you know, I'm currently working, as Ellen said, on an exhibition with my colleague from the newly opened Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles. And that draws on some of these larger ideas to some degree posited today in terms of hot ideas or films or stories hiding in plain sight. We're working on an exhibition called Regeneration Black Film, 1898 through 1971, that will examine hidden histories. It examines the dynamic works of ideas um, that, oops, I think I have something here. Oh, this is a footage. I don't know if we have time for it. So I will um, just move to this, you know, that will examine this hidden history. It examines the dynamic works of artists and film filmmakers working in the 19th century, like this um, 19th and 20th century, excuse me, um, and examines seven decades of Black cinema. It's the first of its kind, and regeneration in, is an exhaustive research, in-depth study of Black participation in American filmmaking. This ambitious exhibition helps advance humanity scholarship by contributing um, 
for a broader audience an exploration of African-American filmmaking, which, like many of the images I've shown earlier, remains largely excluded from cinema history. Regeneration place, replaces or places the longstanding history of Black cinema, both inside and outside of the Hollywood studio system, in a larger social context, making connections, raising questions, provoking timely conversations with discussions of film history, American history, art history and cultural studies um, connects not only the past with the present, but it serves as additional entry points for museum visitors. Um, much of the work of my colleague Doris Berger and assistant curator Raul Guzman and I had to rely on archival work, we had to we had to travel to the Schomburg Center for Black Culture in New York City. We examined materials at the Library of Congress, the Cinémathèque Française, the, um, the Academy Museum of Motion Picture and Art and Sciences, M M uh, Margaret Herrick Library in Los Angeles, and reams of other places. And most of these things were not fully cataloged. I must say, we relied on shell records, scant information. Uh, you know, which gets me to another point that it is essential when we're thinking about difficult histories to really focus attention on metadata and how we tag items, how we make sure we are creating opportunities for intrepid scholars, for curators and the curious to learn and see, you know, things that we may have just sort of otherwise misidentified or not identified at all. I think by doing that, we're allowing ourselves to, you know, sort of establish an, uh, opportunities for greater conversations, you know. So with our work, we were able to, for instance, locate this incredible sketch uh, at the Cinémathèque Française of Carmen Jones, um, or, or you know, a sketch costume design of Carmen Jones, the film that was done in 1954. Um, and it's by this woman costume designer, Helen Rose. And we were just really thrilled that we're, we'll be able to show this alongside the film, you know, clips of the film. Um, it's wonderful that it even still has the, um, you know, examples of the, the, fabric that the costume designer was hoping to create when illustrating this, uh, when developing this sketch. These things were, again, hiding in plain sight um, because it was there and we just so happened to uh, ask a few archivists about any films that they had. We had saw a, a, a very generic shell record and then through digging, they were able to, uh, you know, sort of uncover, discover this find that has never been on view. Um, and, you know, again, part of the reason it's never been on view for them was that they didn't even know sort of how it came into their collection. They didn't know sort of why it was part of the, their, their, their collection and um, were really thrilled and happy to know that we would be able to show this work in our uh, upcoming exhibition. And so, you know, we will be using films, film posters, footage from independent filmmakers, um, you know, like Oscar Michaud. We will show works that are from inside the Hollywood studio. Um, we were able to, with the sensitivity of film, you know, there's a lot of times the, the material is not necessarily um, still available, but fortunately through some preservation work, particularly when I was at the African-American History and Culture Museum, we were able to do some preservation. And so we will be able to show some non-theatrical works that, as well as theatrical works that we think are able to sort of provide, again, a sense of agency, agency in terms of African-American representation. Um, and then that representation allows us to have 
to gain greater insights on spectatorship. Um, it also gives us greater insights on culture. Stories of discovery, be they difficult or not, allow us to better understand the world around us. And when we look at it that way, I think it becomes our duty to tell stories that challenge us. In the end, I think we're better for it. And so with that, I will just try to um, try and see if I can show you a quick little um, clip to end my presentation. Then this is some work that I was able to acquire um, and then work with my colleagues on preserving it. This is home movie footage. Um, J. Max Bond Sr. was this ambassador to Haiti. He was an educator. Um, he worked in Tuskegee, Alabama. He used, again, that idea the agency of the, you know African Americans behind the camera. Um, this is Cab Calloway, the entertainer, and some home movie footage that he um, had that I I worked with my team and we preserved. And so Doris and myself will be showing that some of that Calloway home movie footage. This is footage from 1969 that was um, based in New York um, of a. a project that dealt with poverty and opportunities. This is incredible footage that I was able to find from 1923 from a filmmaker by the name of S.S. Jones. And he went around the state of Oklahoma and he recorded and sort of, sort of as a travel log, if you will, life and culture within African-Americans, um, you know, experience in Oklahoma. And this happened, you know, two or three years after uh, the horrible uprising in or murders, excuse me, in um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, that destroyed tons of African-American community and uh, really uh, allow people an opportunity opportunity to learn more about um, sort of history of film and filmmaking and the longstanding uh, sort of participation of African-Americans within sort of court, uh, culture, portraiture, photography, and image making and, and film. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Rhea. I want to thank you for a couple of um, personal inspirations I just took away from this because some of the people in our audience tonight are people who work on our cataloging and our metadata. And it's a good challenge to make sure that that goes as deep as it possibly can. And also that your captions should stay dynamic and you have to really think about recontextualizing your objects as the world around you is changing. And I want to ask you one um kind of direct question about the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures, since we both were at the opening at the end of September and you're working closely with them now. Um, and then I'll ask the audience for some, some questions. But um, one of the things that's interesting about film museums in general, there's not so many of them in the world, but um, many of them, um, and the debate in LA when this was being built was, would it just be a, a, you know, a temple to worshiping um, the greatness of the industry and the history of the Oscars and the, ce the celebrities, um, you know, or would it be one of the film museums that really just dives into the technology and the crafts um, and is quite scientific? Would it be one that would be more about, um, you know, making the argument that film is a fine art? And it's it's they've they've done those things, but they've done them all through this lens of identity and mm -hmm. um, the many delays on the project resulted in a perspective that's quite um, grounded in 2021. I think if they opened the museum four or five years ago, it wouldn't have had such an intense focus on um, issues of identity and bringing forth some of the untold stories and some of the undersung heroes of the history of, of movies. Um, and of course, the exhibition you're working on is very much in that line. So I guess I wanted to ask you, you know, about 
the 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 task of making a move a, a, a museum about moving images in motion pictures you know you have a, a history of working with pho photography and portraiture and a lot of other art forms but um what's the unique challenge in um telling the history of this relatively new art form too that's kind of it is still sort of arguing for its place amongst the pantheon of you know these mm -hmm. art forms that have been around longer you, you know i think the challenge is finding its place within this pantheon. It is, it is about um, making sure that people appreciate and understand, um, you know, that we, it's, there should uh, understand this disinvestment in these kind of hall of fame museums um, and that, when, when you do that, when you sort of create these moments of just pure celebrity, ce I mean, celebration, um, what, what is being, what's lost in, in that endeavor? And so um, when one is able to walk that sort of delicate line of engaging in things that may feel less familiar, I think what you're doing is you're making it more relevant to a broader group of people. And ultimately that will, I think, keep one, keep an institution that is still finding its way, um, you know, sort of as a top of mind. It won't feel like, you know, it is a one and done sort of, you know, walk a, walk amongst the stars moment, but that it's constantly changing and evolving far more, far richer and exciting um, proposition. And um, it, it's one that is, not necessarily easy, but I think the benefits far outweigh um, some of the setbacks. And um, and I think that, again, when that provides an opportunity for enlightenment and engagement and I think discovery that um, really becomes, you know, something there, there's an element of surprise there. When we are in a place now where so many things can just be sort of Googled, if you will, having these ways, having, you know, sort of things told in a much more dynamic way um, allows people to walk away kind of surprised and um, encouraged. Uh, and I think that, that that becomes sort of an important and, 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 and I think necessary endeavor. So. Yeah, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. Hope that answered your question. Yeah, absolutely. I really do agree with you. And yet it's going to be an interesting path for them because there is um, also, it opens you up to a lot of criticism. Um, and this already happened with the new museum opening where they did focus quite a bit on finding women and African-American um, and other, you know, um, indigenous filmmakers, you know, people from different kinds of filmmaking traditions and communities. They talk about um, sexual harassment in Hollywood. They talk about all kinds of things that you wouldn't have necessarily thought they would. And yet the big criticism they got about two weeks ago is that they didn't cover enough of the history of how it was really um, Jewish emigres from Europe exactly. who founded right. the industry. Right. Um, right. Right. It was kind of assumed that everybody knew that in a way. So that storyline got kind of, yep. you know, filtered out a little bit. So it, it's really a work in progress. It's very, very dynamic. But, you know, the thing is, um, you know, I think we really have to reframe our understanding of museum and museums sort of role. It, it there is there when you think about the origins of museums, it really be, was this sort of, you know, I think. <laughs> 
colonizing endeavor, right, that was going to sort of create this authoritarian narrative that's going to establish what, um, you know, sort of, again, it became a power. It was sort of about a power dynamic of like, you know, whose story gets told, why we're telling it, and that, you know, we have all these artifacts to sort of show this other nation that we are bigger, we are badder, we are bolder. And so um, when we can't think that there is this sort of master narrative, this one story that needs to be told, or that there's this sort of competing, you know, sort of stories that if you tell this one, that means this story gets told is, is out and that this one is foregrounded. No, you know, it is, it is not about sort of creating these um, sort of experiences that once it becomes sort of sanctioned by the museum, then it's worthy of, you know, sort of glory and, and, and recognition. In fact, I think we have to sort of begin to reframe. And I think that's what the Academy Museum was doing, was sort of pushing the stories that have been from the in the margins to the center. Because the center, again, has been, it, it is how we're functioning in the world. You know, if, you know Hollywood studio system is functioning within a very sort of largely uh, culturally Jewish sort of origin. That's part of the origin story. But when that origin story be becomes the primary story, the center story, what else is lost? And so I think the museum was really bold in saying, we want to tell, we want to bring the margin to the center. And then, you know, it's easy to find the other stuff. But if we don't put this material in here, it will likely not be told at all. And I think that and that's an important, you know, I commend them for that sort of bold activity. And I think in my experience, you know, with the African American History and Culture Museum, this is what we, you know, were charged to do and did it by, again, bringing the stories of local collectors or just everyday people, their stories to the center and doing it again at the portrait gallery. So I think there are examples to shun some of the criticism that has been coming their way. Right. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to see if there's any questions from the audience. We have an aisle microphone. We have any questions. I see a hand down here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi. Um, thanks, Ria, for a very uh, invigorating uh, talk. So <laughs> it's 7 uh, 30 p.m. for us, so bear with us. Uh, um, First of all, I, I really like the title of the regeneration uh, exhibition because uh, it bears both the sort of like to regenerate a conversation and also the, you know, the term generation in it. So like who is part of this generation that you're uh, yeah, giving voice to or um, showing? Um, I was wondering how then you still deal with the dilemma of um, arguably not having enough um, representation of probably female or non-heterosexual uh, or... Um, indigenous voices in there to to show like material from female photographers or or b people outside the box or something like that. How do you mm. how do you deal with that if maybe historical material just isn't there to be shown or is there? So I, I'm also asking uh, how diverse can this material be in yeah. in the context of that regeneration? Thanks. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I appreciate that. It and invigorating is <laughs> quite the adjective. So thank you for that too. I don't know if that's good, bad or otherwise, but I'm going to go with good. Um, <laughs> so in terms of how we're dealing with it, I think one of the ways in which my colleague and I are trying to address that is through contemporary, bringing in contemporary voices. Um, you know, in addition to the exhibition, uh, we've, we one, we've tried very diligently to sort of think about 
about, um, you know, sort of the role in particular women played within this conversation. We, you know, grounded with four sort of thinkers, um, one of them being uh, in four thinkers in terms of the importance of imagery and images. And we start with someone named Sojourner Truth, uh, who used her photographic image as a way to kind of um, promote an anti, you know, to promote herself as um, someone who was a anti-slavery activist. Um, but again, starting before film um, helped us to, um, the art of film helped us to sort of think about ways in which we wanted to incorporate women. Um, we, again, in our exhibition catalog, bring in contemporary voices, filmmakers like Ava DuVernay, a documentary filmmaker by the name of Don Porter. We look at some of the early um, women editors and um, and documentary filmmakers like this woman named Madeline Anderson and bring her story to the fore. When it comes to sexual orientation or other sort of identities, you know, we're not trying to quote unquote out somebody. If someone is sort of self-identified in such a way, we would be happy to kind of make sure that that becomes relevant within the story we're telling. Um, but ultimately we, I think as two women curating this show brought to mind the fact that yes, this was a predominantly sort of male centered um, sort of endeavor, but for instance, when thinking about someone like Oscar Michaud, we not only talk about him, but we talk about his wife, who was instrumental in this man being able to make over 40 films. We talk about her role as not only sort of a producer, if you will, uncredited, but also she was an actress in his work. So this is the way in which we're really trying to think holistically about how we tell, how we regenerate some of these stories. Right. Any other questions? The two over on the other side. Sorry, Michaela has to do some walking. Thank you very much. And greetings from Frankfurt or Berlin and the other cities people are coming from. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned in your talk, uh, sorry, I didn't get the beginning. You mentioned Roland Barthes. Do you ha have uh, any other authors in mind which uh, who are important to you? Do you have any role models concerning your work? And uh, last point, uh, uh, how do you get your material? Do you also place ads, for example, to get uh, inspiration, to get information on people worthwhile being shown or presented? So mm -hmm. thank you. I hope you understand. Thank you. Um, well, I... Yes, I mentioned also um, the um, Stuart Hall, but I get inspiration from people like um, cultural theorist um, Bell Hooks. Um, Gordon Parks is also someone whose work I, you know, often look to and revere. And uh, Dr. Deborah Willis is someone who I often um, look to as well, who has done an, a tremendous amount of work, particularly around uh, the history of Black photographers. Um, and, and, um, of course, James Baldwin, I think, is always at the forefront of much of the work in the projects that I, I do. Uh, to your other question, when thinking about collecting and, and developing uh, uh, regeneration, the film, the, the exhibition regeneration, uh, we looked at a lot of Beinecke, um, music library at Harvard, the Library of Congress. Um, we s sort of started with some sort of established institutions um, and looked at many of their archives. Um, word of mouth has helped in terms of identifying private collectors. And um, when establishing the African American Museum, we did do a variety of sort of outreach projects, um, helping 
collect people throughout the country kind of understand how to conserve and preserve the, their sort of family artifacts and objects. And it was in that vein, we were able to then sort of learn more about things that people had. They would come very humbly and say, oh, does this, is this something that you think would be useful in a museum? And then it would be, you know, and come to find out, like I said, you know, it's Harriet Tubman shawl, for instance, that was literally under someone's bed in their house. Um, so it was a variety of ways in which we have been able to look at um, and identify objects for um, for the various projects that I've either discussed or am working on. Great. I think we'll take just this one last question here and then let you guys all go to the reception and let Rhea get on with her sunny day in Los Angeles. Okay, thanks for the opportunity for the last question. Um, thanks, Rhea, for your very inspiring and positive talk and your insight into your work. Um, so you are, I understand your mission as making collections and through, through collecting, through, through curating, making cultural institutions and their collections more whole, more representative. Mm -hmm. Do you also yes. have time to, because this conference is called, I don't know what the official uh, translation is, but en enabling access, um, be it, mm. you know, through open data or anything. So do you also have time to focus on enabling more access in terms of the boards, staff and audiences you're working with? Because that's also important, and especially in the US, I think, to make the arts sector more whole and more representative. Absolutely. I, thank uh, you for that question. Um, shaping access. So let's thank you. Ah, OK. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, I access is is instrumental. It's one of the sort of pillars of, of my work in terms of what I value. And I think that the museum, the Smithsonian as a whole has committed itself to access um, and digitizing our archives and making them available um, and, and participating in open access, um, I don't know, platforms um, and really are committed to that. Uh, the Smithsonian, I think, like many of your museums, is free. And so, you know, for us, this value of having access becomes paramount to the ways in which we understand this work would, you know, can be told and, and, and experienced. Uh, and so with when I was senior curator of photography and film, I made it a point to um, create and digitize our moving image catalog and work very closely with rights and reproduction to sort of create um, a database that would allow people a chance to see some of like the moving image material I showed you all that would allow us to um, really give people a greater opportunity to understand the the depth in which um, our collections go, because as you know, access is really critical, um, considering that a lot of work will not be able to be on view, um, you know, for extended amounts of time or without being a part of a larger sort of special exhibition. So uh, I guess, you know, within the institution writ large, uh, that are committed to creating platforms, and we have already established one, uh, you know, for open access, more and more of the institutions are digitizing their material so that they can make it available to others. And I was able to work closely. That's the benefit of establishing a museum, working with a new museum, was able to start from the beginning with saying access will be a priority. And so we put benchmarks and, and things in place to make sure we were able to um, 
preserve, digitize, and then upload that material and make it available for people online to see. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I am so grateful that you were able to join us. Um, and maybe sometime soon we'll get you over here in person. Um, that would be great. Yeah, we'd love it. Um, so um, thank you. We'll all say goodbye and let you go. Um, thank you. Yes, to, I'm back, back to your busy work day. Yes, very busy, thank struggling. You. So I appreciate you all. Yeah, thank, thank thanks you. to your director for free, giving you the time this morning to, to be with yes. us. Um, all right, Take so care. I will. I'll catch Bye. up with you later, and to Great. the rest of the audience, thank you all so much. And um, feel free to head upstairs and enjoy a glass of wine and something to eat, and some good conversations. So, Dankeschön. Mm -hmm.